Oh, it looks like we've just lost part of Carol's stream. We'll just try and sort out these technical issues and get started shortly. Hey, Tom, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, the thing just threw me off and I had to log back on again. Ah, oh, right, okay. Cool. Um, but, I'm, but I'm back. Alrighty. I think we can probably get started now as well then. Okay, I'll just get the participants up so I can see people's names. Yep, Carol, do you also want to just make me a co-host just so I can um, yeah, meet I'll people those sorts of things? Sounds like can... If you just that. hover over my name, click more and it should be an option. Oh, okay. More. Uh, my co-host. Yep, yeah, perfect. Okay, that's done. Perfect. <clears throat> okay, shall I start? Sounds like a plan. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks to Tom for inviting me to do this. Um, I'll start by giving a little bit of background and then I will explain what's going to be in the lecture and then of course I will start the lecture. My name is Carol Morgan, you can see it at the bottom there and at the moment I'm teaching a course in second year um, 6721 called Informal Methods which Tom attended two years ago and the topic of that course is in two words more programming but in more than two words it is um, how to program in a different way that helps you to get your programs right first time, helps you to understand them better, and sometimes um, just leads to better programs overall. There's not much of a change that you have to make, actually. Uh, the key thing, as I will emphasize as we go through, is thinking, it can be distilled into thinking about what you write in your comments, strangely enough, even though, of course, the comments are not executed. It's what you write in the comments and how you decide what to write there, which makes the difference that I'm going to try to explain. The way I'm going to explain it is to develop a fairly simple program, the kind that you might get as an exercise in 1501. In fact, I actually took this from 1501 um, probably about 10 years ago when I knew somebody who was doing it and was looking at his exercises and I thought that's a nice one to, um, to use as an example. So it is actually originally this one, uh, more or less the 1501 exercise. But I'll do it three times. And each time I will emphasize a little bit more the message I'm trying to get across about how you think about doing these things. And I would hope that what I would be letting you see is what difference it could make. So let's, with all that, let's get started. And uh, what you should be seeing now is the description of the problem. It's called the repeated letters problem. And inside the blue box there is a typical English description of the problem. We've got an array um, called capital A. It is a size capital N. So it means it's indexed from zero up to N minus one. And what you have to do for this program is to find the longest subsegment. I'll come back to subsegment in a moment, that contains no repeated letters right next to each other. In other words, no stuttering. So for example, down here, you can see that there's two Cs. So that's an example of stuttering. And here in the blue box, you can see that there is a, C, a segment CBCD that contains no repeated letters, although the repeated letters do occur beyond its endpoints on either side. <clears throat> Subsegment as opposed to subsequence means that the contents of it have to be right next to each other. It's not um, some spread out portion of the usual sequence or array, it is actually a bit cut out of it somewhere. And so the point, the, the goal of this program is to find the longest chunk that you can cut out of the sequence A here of length 11 that contains no repeated letters. So um, the longest one here happens to be the one that I indicated there. So the answer for this program with this particular array A should be four because that's the length of that sequence C, B, C, D. It can't be extended on the left 
because there's two Cs there. It can't be extended on the right because there's two Ds there. And although there are other examples of non-repeating sub-segments, for example, here's one, AB, it's only too long, actually ABC, oops, ABC, which is three long, but still that's not the longest because the longest one is the one that follows C, B, C, D. So that's the problem to find the length of that. <clears throat> Finding the actual sequence itself is also not hard once you've done the length, but we'll just concentrate on the length. So as I mentioned in the intro just now, I'm going to do this three different ways. And we'll start with the first one, which is, described at the bottom of this slide, <clears throat> which is to split the problem into two simpler pieces. And in general, that's always a good idea. Um, if you can take a big problem and divide it neatly into smaller ones and then solve them one at a time, of course, that makes the overall job easier, provided you can put this, the um, individual solutions together once you have them. So this is a good first step. And it is related to the overall message that I'm going to be um, telling you about today, but it's not the main message but let's see what happens when we do that. So the two pieces that we're going to pick for this, um, of those, the first one is this one described down here at the bottom. So I'm going to introduce an auxiliary array B. In other words, we, we are given A, but I'm going to introduce an array B. And the first thing that I will do is to go through A and find all the places where these repeated letters happen. So I'll solve that problem. That is the problem of recognizing repeated letters first. And then after that, I will try to figure out from that where the longest subsegment is that doesn't have repeated letters. So with that in mind, here's a description of the first part. I made it a character array, but of course it doesn't matter uh, what's in there. <clears throat> and what we're going to do is to store the indices of the first occurrence of each repeating pair in this auxiliary array B. Now just below here, I've given an example of how that works with the array that we have here. So the first repeated pair is this CC, and it occurs at index two because we start counting from zero. So there's zero, there's, there's zero, A0, A1, A2. So A2 is the first of the pair CC. The second one that we find is this DD down here, which is at index six, zero, one, two, three, four, five, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, yes. And the second one is there at seven. They overlap, but it doesn't matter. <clears throat> and when we've done all that, we end up with this array B, which tells us where the repeated letters are. And the length of B is three, which tells us that there are three occurrences of repeated letters. So that's the first part of the program. The second part um, will be to try to figure out what lengths of non-repeating segments these numbers tell us. There will be one sitting here, there will be one sitting here, and there will be one sitting there, and there will be one sitting there. So there's, there will be four possibilities to consider. So let's try writing a program for that. And I've conveniently left a blank page here because I'm going to go through writing the program with you. And I might actually ask some of you to suggest things um, that we might put in here to write this program in a typical um, programmer style. This is not just a one five double one style. This is kind of thing that anybody does. So we will start off with, uh, we'll assume that we've got the array A declared somehow. If my handwriting is a little bit shaky, it's because it is very cold at the moment, even though the room is heated. So we've got this integer array A that is size N, and we're going to try to solve this problem for an arbitrary A and an arbitrary N. And one thing we know right away is that for some values of N, the solution is immediate. Some very small values of n, just to give you a clue. So can anybody suggest, um, if I said something like, if n, and then compared it with something, under what conditions would we be able to return an answer, or use return for this, um, return an answer right away, when n is what? Yeah. 
What about when n is zero, when a is an empty array? What's the longest subsegment of non repeating letters in that array? David, what do you think? Sorry, I'm kind of just uh, here to get as much of a recap as I can. I'm actually working, so I'm not really paying. Oh, okay, so I won't. Uh, Sorry. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> I'll leave you alone in that case, but I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Okay, uh, anybody else like to have a go? So what about if the array is of length zero, the array A is length zero, then the longest subsegment of that array whether it contains repeated letters or not, is also zero, okay? What about if the length of the array is one? Can it have repeated letters in it? Anyone? How about you, Ben, what do you think? Suppose the array, was, the array A is just one long, so the array A is just, I'll just pick a letter, it's just that. It's just P. No, yeah, it's just a, a set with one element has no. I can't quite hear you. I have to speak up a bit. Oh, a set with one element has no opportunity for repetition. Exactly so. So in the case of n equals zero or one, we already know what the answer is, right? There's not going to be any repeated letters in there. So we can say that if n is less than two, then the longest uh, non-repeating subsegment is going to be the whole of A, right? So we return N because we know that that's the length of A. So is everybody happy with that? So that's kind of handy actually, because very often um, the situations where the array is empty or very small have to be handled uh, specially. And so we've dealt with that right away. So now we know that the value of N is at least two. And of course, uh, those two letters could be the same. So we could have PP, in which case the answer would be zero, or they could be different. Uh, let's call it PR in that case, in which case the answer would be two. So now we do have some work to do. And we're going to, uh, remember we're looking just for the occurrence of repeated letters now, not actually the longest one. So we will be going through two arrays at the same time. We'll be going through A and we'll be going through B. So I'll declare some variables for that. Int N, initialize it to zero. And int M, initialize that also to zero. And as a comment here, I'm just gonna remind myself that I'm using N to go through A and M to go through B. So since N is going through A, we're going to be doing the standard kind of while loop thing where N starts at zero and it stops somewhere. Now we're looking for repeated letters. So how far do you think N can go before there's no hope of finding any more repeated letters in A? It obviously can't go further than N minus one because that's the index of the last element in A. But N minus one in A can't be the first of a pair of repeated letters, can it? Because there is no letter following. So where should N stop? I'll draw a picture here to help. So here we have A coming off there just beyond the end of it is indexed n. This one here is indexed n minus one. This one here is indexed n minus two. And we're looking for places where we can get repeated letters. Now, of course, we could find one there because the last two letters might be repeated, but this one cannot be the first of a pair of repeated letters because there is no letter here. So where should n, what should we put here? Jeremy, what do you think? So this is 
n minus one there. This is n minus two. So what do you think about <clears throat> stopping n, oops, at no higher than n minus one? It means the last value of n we'll be looking at is n minus two, which is this one. So we, the last check we will be doing is, are these two letters the same or are they not? So here we are, and we now have to check to see whether we've, we've found a repeated pair. Let's clear this up and make it a little bit easier to read. So suppose we've been going along for a while. And here we are, and here's A, N. And here's A, N plus one. And way down the end here is the very last one, A, big N minus one. And we are now looking there. We want to know, have we found a repeated pair or not? So what should we put inside this if? to decide whether we found a repeated pair or not. If, if you don't mind, could you just quickly, because I think I missed just a little bit at the beginning. Um, could you just recap some of the parts like uh, the purpose of Bs? B is the array of distinct elements, is that right? Yeah, I can do that. So let's see if it's, yes, this explains it here, I hope. So if we look at, um, the A and the B sitting there. So the A that I'm using for the example is this one here. And the B is supposed to identify for us the double letters that are occurring in A. So there's three instances of those indicated by the blue lines I've put above there and there, there and there. So this is a double C, then there's a double D, and then there's another double D which overlaps the first one. And what B is supposed to do is to give the indices in A of where those things occur. So the first element of B says there's a double letter that begins at two. So A2 and A3 are both the same letter. And this B6 here is telling us that A6 and A7 are the same letter. And this B7 there is telling us that B7 and B8 are the same letter. And that's yes, the thing yes. we're trying to do for B. So the if should be, at the beginning of an answer there, but not the end of it. Is it counting on a contiguous repetition? Yes, right next to each other. Yep. And only two. Only two. So, yeah, so we're only checking two letters at a time. So what we're really interested in is whether the current letter is equal to the next one, right? Mm -hmm. And so that should be an equals what? Uh, well, you could go back or forth. It could be an equals an minus one or an plus one. Yeah. So I'm going to put an plus one here. And of course, you could go either way. So we have to decide at the very beginning whether this, these indices in B are indicating the first or the second of the pair. And we have to be consistent about that. So if we go back here, we can see that I just decided arbitrarily that the index of B would indicate the first of the pair. So that means I would be looking at the current one and the one after. So that's why we're doing n plus one here. And if, I've, if in fact they're equal, then that's another entry to go into B. So I'm going to put the current value of n into B at its current position. And then of course, um, probably you would write this because this is like hand operation. So that points to the current index that you found. For example, that would put this two, oh, sorry, we put, yes, we would put two into the, into the zeroth position of B, and then it would increment M by one, which would mean that the length of B is now one. So after we found this double C here, B would look like that. So having done that, we go on and have a look. N plus one. And so that's a good stab at the first part of the program. I was tempted when I was writing this up um, to put an N plus plus here. 
so that I didn't have to do that. And I didn't do it. Would anyone like to, does anyone have an opinion on whether it would be a good idea to put the N plus plus there? One idea is plus plus in general is not as general as pseudocode, so it might infer specific languages. Yeah, that's a good answer. I mean, the main problem with plus plus is um, this question of style and being safe is that in many cases you don't actually know when it happens. So the reason that I didn't put plus plus in here is because I suspected that your teachers in 1511 warned you off it for, for this reason. We've got ends up here. And it's possible that some kind of optimizing compiler could, could decide to implement end at this point um, before it checks that or not. But since you don't know, it's probably best not to do that. Anyway, since I've made a terrible mess of this slide, it's lucky that I wrote this out on the next slide, which is where I expected this to end up. I think that's more or less exactly what we wrote. And actually, um, just in case somebody thought of it, it would be enough to initialize B to, to make B as long as N minus one, um, because you cannot have N pairs in an array of length N, you can only have N minus one of them. You can't fit anything in there. But this is the first part of the program. Now, I understand, of course, that this is not a super um, interesting program, although uh, sometimes exercises in themselves are not. They're to exercise you, to help you develop good style and good insight into how to write things. But there is something interesting about this enterprise that we have already reached. We've done the first part of the program here. And now it's time for a comment. And this I'm going to spend a little bit of time on because the comment we write here is going to turn out to be very important in the whole scheme of uh, how we approach problems like this. So here's an example of a comment. So the first part is what we just did there. So that was what was sitting there. We haven't done the second part yet, so that's still to do. And it would be a good idea, since we've done it in two parts, to put a comment there that says what we've done. And so that's the comment I've put there. And I think that's a reasonable comment, and it's the sort of comment that I would expect from many people at this stage. But it's not the only comment you could put there. So basically, um, looking at that comment, slightly abstracting, you can see what it's doing. It's telling us, so to speak, what we did. It's describing the first part of this program as an activity that we have carried out. Of course, it wasn't us, it was the computer, but the computer did it because we told it, so to speak. But here's an alternative. So this is the same scenario here, but I've written a different comment. There's this one, and there's that one. And in fact, here, I put them both on the same page so you can see them both sitting there as alternatives. Now, can anyone see a qualitative difference in these comments in the style of what they're actually saying? The first one I've already said described an activity that we carried out. What is the second one doing? The second one also helps to indicate what the assumptions of the programmer were when they wrote the algorithm. Yeah, good answer. And that's the first half of the answer. And what else has it done? I guess in a general sense, it also helps to convey uh, the intention of the algorithm. Yes. Um, if you put yourself in the position of the person who's going to write the second part, and we compare these two things, this one and this one. So imagine you're two separate people working in the company and one person has written that, uh, has written this rather, and they left that comment or they've left that comment. If you are the person who's doing the second part, which of these two comments would you rather, rather have? The left one or the right one? Definitely the right one. Definitely the right one. Yes, and the reason is that the right one is telling you what is true at that point in the program. That's the key essential difference between these two comments. This one on the left is telling us what the program did and that's fine. And if you did end up with this, 
what you do is probably ask to see the code of the first part. And then with the help of this comment, you'd figure out what was going on. And then you'd be able to go on and do the second part. But the really interesting thing is that if you have this comment over here, you do not need to see the first part of the program at all. You don't need to look at it. It could be written by somebody else in another country last, last month. This is all you need to know how to write the second part of the program. So this is what I've been calling, um, and I call it this in the uh, uh, recorded lecture that was also available, what's true here, comments. In other words, they say not what I did in the program or what I'm about to do, or what the last iteration of the loop did or what the next one did. They're saying, what is true about the variables right now? And I abbreviate it WT. Uh, H. I have to be careful not to say WTF. Sometimes happens. These are WTH programs, uh, comments, right? And so this is the one we want. And this is the first main point of what I'm telling you now, that there's this qualitative difference between the kind of comments you can write, and it doesn't cost you anything except a little bit of extra thought as you're getting used to it, to write one or the other. You don't have to write more comments. You just have to write them with a different aim in mind, describing what is true at this point in the program. And it is this simple fact that makes all the difference. Let's see what happens. This comment, we've chosen the right-hand one, is the glue that sticks the two parts of the program together. We've got this first part, which was written by one person. And the result of what she did is that this is true at that point of the program. And we've got the second part, and all he needs to know is this, he doesn't need to know anything about the actual code that's sitting up there. So this glue sticks the two things together. You want to write comments, these what's true here comments that are like glue that sticks things together because then you can think of the pieces that are stuck together separately. And since you're using this, this comment style, what's true here is the glue, you can then put them together and be sure that they'll work. So let's go on and look at the second half. This is the comment that we have. We don't need to go back and look at the first part. Let's see what we're going to do now. We're going to have to try to figure out what is the length of the sequence that this two indicates. Going back to before the beginning, that this one indicates, that this one indicates, and this one indicates. And that turns out to be a little bit tricky in a kind of irritating, way, as we'll see, but let's have it go anyway. So first of all, there's one possibility that we found no repeated letters at all. So what will we test for that? Let's go back here and have a look at our comment. What variable can we check? Just looking at this comment, what variable can we check to see whether we found any repeated letters at all? M will be zero. Exactly so. So if M is zero, then again, we know that there are no um, repeated letters. So again, we can say the length we're looking for is the whole of it. <clears throat> but otherwise we're gonna have to do some maxing. What we have to do is go through and look at, in this case, four different possibilities and see which one is the longest. So we'll have an integer L which will be the length, and we will be maxing it with things as we go along. But for the moment, I'm not going to fill it in. And then we will have an index k that will be going through b. We're going to start that at the first element of b, so that will be 0. And then we will move k along. And at each position of k, we will see figure out what is the length of the non-repeating subsequence, subsegment we found there. So we're going to be comparing the subsegment that is indicated by BK to be K plus one with L and making L bigger. Um, I'm going to write it like this here, but 
later on, I define a macro max, which does the same job. So if something is bigger than L, if the current length that we've discovered from BK to BK plus one is bigger than the current L, then we assign that value to L. So this is just L gets L max question mark. And then we go on. And finally, k will reach its value of m minus one. Now, I did say it was going to be a little bit irritating. It turns out that there's three separate cases that we have to consider here when we do this little calculation about how long that segment is. There's the case when we're looking at the first element of b. There's a case when we're looking at some intermediate elements of b, like that one. Or there's another one. Um, that one, it's sitting in between here, just the D on its own. And then there's the last one. So this is the kind of thing, you know, at least I wouldn't be able to work out of my head as we were going along, but you can certainly do it on your own. You can see I've left them out here and I've drawn little pictures to show you the kind of things we're going on. The first case, this is the one here, is when we're looking at the very first element of B. And you want to say, what is the length of that segment that's sitting there? And if you work it out carefully, you will find that it turns out to be D zero plus one. I wouldn't accept my word for that, but that's what I think it is. If we're looking at this one, it turns out to be D K plus one minus BK. And if we're looking at this one that falls off the end at the top, it turns out to be N minus B M minus one, which is this one here, minus one. So those are things that you would check very carefully, of course, because if any one of them was wrong, the program would be wrong. But having done all that, In here, you end up with the complete program. So this is the end of the first solution. So I don't know, is that about 20 lines long? It's pretty simple. It divides nicely into two pieces, this piece and this piece. It's pretty clear what's going on. There are some little interesting details here that you have to get exactly right. In other words, as a one five double one exercise is pretty well perfect. It exercises all the things that you have to do right. Divide the problem into two pieces. Go to the siren goes. Yes. Divide it into two pieces. But there is a new ingredient here, and it is this comment in between. Not that you wouldn't have put a comment there, but the nature of that comment. So if I want you to take one thing away from this part of the presentation, it is not that I put a comment there, but what kind of comment it was. It's a what's true here comment. It means, for example, that you could get a programmer to do this bit. And as long as she wrote the what's true here comment there that we've been talking about, she could then go home and leave the rest to you. And we could get a different programmer who picks up that what's true here comment, the same one, and writes the second half, and she never sees your code, and you never see her code, and then you put them together, you get the right program. So that's the end of the first part. And the message I want to leave with you there is, well, maybe that's a nice problem to, to practice on, but also there is this really important aspect of it, which is how do you write that comment in the middle? What's the style of it? And the style is you describe what the value of the variables the, the property that the value of the variables have at that point, and that allows you, allows the first half to have a target, and it has it allows the second half to have the right place to begin. So now solution two, there is something odd about solution one, uh, although it's simple, and is this array B? Do we really need to have an extra array or not, do you think? Or can we solve it without an extra array?
Oh, Richard, what do you think? Can we get away without without having that extra that extra array B? This give you a clue. If we go back here. We're only ever looking where we're there. We're only ever looking at either one or two or one B at a time. In other words, we're only ever looking at adjacent elements of B. So what do you think? Can we get away without having the whole of B there? The only question that needs to be solved is the, the second part, right? Which is the, what is the distance between segments of repeating characters? So in which case yeah. you don't need a second array because you could use a, a variable to store that information between counting each of the repeated elements. Exactly so. Yeah, so since we only need two at a time, we just need two variables that keep track of the ones we're actually interested in. So that's what solution two is going to do. So um, when I explored this, writing this solution, it, it reminded me of a caterpillar, you know, how caterpillars move, that they, they bring their tails up to where their heads are, and then their heads spread out and go to the next place it wants to be, and then the tail comes up. So it's a kind of squinchy, squinchy, squinchy movement. And that's what motivated the way I was looking at this second solution. That's, of course, the very hungry caterpillar you've probably seen. So the caterpillar at one point, for example, will be here with its tail at the beginning and its head at the first repeated elements there. And then a little while later, it will be there. When it's here, the length that it's found is three, that one. When it's here, the length that it's found is four, which is that one. So at each stage, we're going to have to figure out what length of non-repeating subsegment the caterpillar is found. But we're also going to have to manage how to move the head and the tail of the caterpillar. But the advantage of that will be that you will end up without needing um, another extra array B. So we're actually going to use a caterpillar to do this. One thing that we will have to address eventually is figuring out from where the head and the tail of the caterpillar are exactly what length of subsegment is found. I've decided, and it's an arbitrary decision, that, that in both cases I will concentrate on the first element of the pair. That's what we did in the first solution anyway. And then you just have to figure out if the tail of the caterpillar is here and the head of the caterpillar is there, what's the length that it is found? So that again is a little bit of arithmetic, which you can do for yourselves. But the point is that you have to do it carefully, obviously, to get the right answer. So if we follow the caterpillar's progress through this very same array, it starts off here, and then the head of it moves down to there. The tail is still back at the beginning. And then the tail comes up to where the head was, to here, and then the head moves down to there. And then the tail comes up to where the head was, which is there, and then the head moves onto there, and so on. So the caterpillar inches its way through the segment. And what we have to do is to write the code that describes the way the caterpillar moves along. So let's try that step first, the inching along step. So we'll suppose that the caterpillar is here. And the next place it will have found a segment is there. How does it get from one place to the other? Well, clearly what it's going to do is to move the H along until it finds another repeated letter, DD in this case, which is found just there. And then once it's done that, it will say, aha, how long a segment have I found? And then finally, it will move the T up to the H and then carry along again. So there's really just two cases here. Is there, a, a, for moving at the head of the caterpillar, the caterpillar is going to be looking at the place where its head is, and it's going to be looking one step ahead and saying, is the next thing the same as this thing or not? So, so as not to put everybody through the ringer, I've just basically written this down, but I will explain here what's going on. Again, I've drawn little pictures to make sure that I got the arithmetic right. So we have a loop here, which is while true, and the way out of the loop is there at that break. So the caterpillar moves its head one along, and then it sees whether the next step beyond that is beyond the end of the array. 
If so, it knows that it's gone as far as it can. And so it has to do this little calculation here to figure out what is the length of the very last segment that it found and max that with the current value. And then all is done and it comes out. At the bottom here, we'll have a return L. If on the other hand, it is still within the bounds of the array, then it has to look and see whether the place its head is now has the same letter in as the place one in front of its head. If so, then it knows that it has found the extreme of a subsegment. And so it has to figure out what the length of it is. It turns out to be h minus t. In this case, there's no plus or minus one, but you still have to check and figure that out. It records that as possibly a new maximum, and then it brings the tail up to where the head is. Now, the last thing I want to talk about here, though, is on this particular slide, and we have something more to do on the next slide, is this initialization. You notice the t equals minus one, h gets, gets minus one at the beginning. This is something that I personally call a initialization by time machine. Because what's going on here is that it's not so hard to figure out what you should be doing in the middle of this loop. But it is a little bit difficult to figure out how to get the whole thing started. So when you use the, so to speak, time machine uh, technique for finding the initialization, it's as if you're running the algorithm back in your head, backwards in your head, and you're thinking, well, what do I have to set up at the beginning of this in order to get the whole thing working properly on the very first step inside the loop? And so you kind of execute the program backwards and see, well, what values do I have to put there? And it's an error-prone kind of process, and it's also kind of irritating because it's you end up with these minus ones and things in a program that has no array index minus one. But um, I suppose you could think of this as the caterpillar bunched up just before the beginning of the array, but it doesn't really matter. <clears throat> what matters is it, it is a slightly unpleasant thing to have to do. And um, so these initializations by time machine um, are to be avoided if you possibly can. But there's a much more important message hidden in this program, and that is, this loop here and how we understand the way it works. There's something that allows us to understand the loop in a very easy way if we can only find it. There's something that's true here at the beginning of every iteration of the loop. And there's something that's true there at the end of every iteration of the loop. It's the same thing. So if we can figure out what that is, it tells us what the initialization has to be because it has to make this true to start with because you can get here from two places. You can get there from here, or you can get there from there. And it also tells you that you have to reestablish that fact down here below. And this thing, this what's true here comment, in this case, turns out to be that the value L is correct. In other words, it's the longest for what we've looked at in A already. And each time we move head along and we make it true for the next time and the next time. So what's going on here is the same glue kind of effect. But this time, instead of gluing two different parts of the program together, the beginning, the first part and the second part, we're gluing bits of a loop together because a loop of course iterates its body many times. And very often you don't, how many, you don't know how many times that will be. And if you try to think in terms of understanding that loop as a whole, it can get very confusing. But if you can only find something that is true at the beginning and at the end of every iteration of the loop body, then all you have to worry about is what's going on in here to get from that point to this point. 
question. As long as you can make sure that this, um, the, the what's true comment, you could put at the end here, is the same as the what's true comment you were relying on at the beginning, then you only have to make sure that this little bit of straight line code in between takes you successfully from here to there. So that's the end of the second solution. And we're getting close to the end of the whole lecture, in fact, because this is the last solution. And the big innovation here, now that we've seen these what's true here comments, what, what they can do. In the first case, they allowed us to glue part one of the program together with part two. In the second, they allowed us to glue the separate iterations of the loop together, one after the other, so we only had to think of one of them at a time. But what about if we write a what's true comment, what's true here comment at the very beginning, at the very start, before we even start any coding? And this is going to be our final treatment of this program. So I've written again the original goal. Hasn't changed, but it gives me the opportunity to introduce this abbreviation NL, which means no repeated. And what we're looking for is the program to set L to be the longest non-repeating segment in all of A. But what we will do as we're going along is, has the, is have the L is always correct for the part of the array we've seen already. And that's what I mean by this A colon N. This means the first N elements of the A. So L will always be, on every loop iteration, the length of the longest non-repeating segment in A up to the current value of N. So that is going to be something that's true at the beginning and the end of every loop. To get from that value being true, to get for that thing being true at N and moving on to N plus one, it turns out, and we will see why in a minute, that we need the second thing, which I've called M here, which is the starting position of the longest non-repeating segment that ends just before the bit of the array we've looked at. See a picture of that in a moment. This L and M will turn out to be all we need. And the idea behind it is that if you know that L is correct for the first N elements, given the longest non-repeating subsegment for the first N elements, and you need to include just one more element, which will be A N then if you have to change L, it will only be because there is a new non-repeating subsegment which uses the AN that you've just included because you've already, you've already taken the maximum of all the other ones. So the only way that maximum can change is if you find a new one. And the only way you can find a new one is if it uses an element of the array that you hadn't looked at before. And the only place that can be is at the very end. So that's where the second Thing comes from. These things are in some cases not immediately obvious, but once you've found them, everything else just magically falls into place. And that's what you're going to see now. So are there any questions about this before I go on? What these things mean? Okay, let's see what happens. <clears throat> Here they are repeated. Remember we had this issue with the time machine initialization. Well, we don't have that problem now anymore. We want to know how to initialize the loop. We have two things that have to be true when the loop starts. One of them is that L has to have the correct value. You can see here that N is zero. So if N is zero, the length of the, uh, the array we've looked at is the empty array. What's the length of the longest non-repeating subsegment sub of the empty array? The empty array only has zero length subsegments in it. So the length of the longest one has to be what? Zero, yeah, so we can make L zero. What about M, which is the start, the starting position of the longest non-repeating subsegment that ends just before A N? That's a little bit um, trickier, but um, since the array is empty, 
we can start that at zero as well. And so this second thing tells us what M must be initialized to. So we've initialized the loop here without having to run a time machine, without knowing what the loop condition is, without knowing what the loop body is, and without knowing what the program is supposed to do. The only thing we've used to figure out what these initializations have to be are these two things here. So these are really, really important comments. And the ones I've indicated with the orange arrows through the three examples we've done have become steadily more important. The first one was just to glue two bits of the program together. The second one was to understand that caterpillar loop. And the third one now is going to do three things for us. It's going to initialize, it's going to tell us what the loop condition is, and it's actually going to help us write the loop body. So they are filled in <clears throat> these two values that we figured out from here. And the effect of those is to make sure that both of these two things are true at the end of the initialization. That's what the initialization is for, is to make sure that these things are ready when the loop is about to begin. What's the loop condition? Well, that's figured out for us as well, because <clears throat> we know that what we're trying to achieve overall is that L is the length of the longest non-repeating subsegment in all of A. And that's A up to and including, uh, up to but not including capital N. What we know from here though, is that L will always have the correct value for A up to and not including little n. So all that we need to know in order to convert this, which we already have, we have it here, into that, which is what we need for the whole program, is this extra fact that little n equals big N. And where is that? It's at the end of the loop. And what is going to be true at the end of the loop? It's going to be the opposite of the loop guard. So these two things are the opposite of each other, and they always are. So by looking at this, which we've already understood, and by looking at this, which was the problem statement, we figured out that this is enough to get us from one to the other, and it has told us what the loop condition is. So now we have written the initialization and we've written the loop condition without seeing the loop body at all. We're writing the program from the outside in, notice, instead of from the front to the end. And here is what happens when we finally bite the bullet and go into the inside of the loop. Because of what we've already done, we know that these two things are true at the beginning of the loop. If they're true here, for the very first iteration of the loop, they will be true there. Why? Because nothing has happened between here and here. If it's true here, it's going to be true there. Now let's just suppose for a moment that we've written the code correctly in the middle here that make sure that this is true at the end of the loop. Will it be true at the beginning of the loop of the next iteration? Yes, because from this point, it's because of the way loops work, we go back to there. And so if it's true here, it will be true there. And if it's true there, it will be true here again. And if it's true here, it will be true there again. And if it's true there, it will be there again. And so this thing will constantly be true until finally we escape the loop and it is true here. And as we've already seen, what we have at the end of the loop there is the additional fact that little n is equal to big N because of the negation of the loop guard. And that gives us the overall solution. So all we have to do now is to figure out how to get, oops, from here to there. We do that in two steps. The first one is, let's take things out of the way. The first one is that we have to make sure that this will be true at the end of the loop. 
So we look at the current value of n and look at a at the current value of n and ask whether it's the same as the one before. And if it is, then the longest non-repeating subsegment that ends here will actually start here as well. The whole thing will be of length zero. So then you set n equal to n. Then we move one along and we look at here the new longest subsegment ending where we are with no repeated letters. And if it's bigger than the other we have already, we take that instead. So there's two steps here. One is to look after this bit. And one is to look after this bit. But believe it or not, that's all there is. And so if we put all these three things together, these are exactly what we had before. So there's no need to squeeze and read them. And this will be posted on the um, website, the 6721 website afterwards anyway, this whole thing so you can come and have a look. But we have three separate solutions to the same problem. One of them used a certain kind of comment here. One of them used, so this is a kind of um, gluing together of two parts. One of them used the same kind of comment here, which is usually called an invariant. And the third one said, let's think of the invariant before we start and then use it to write the initialization to figure out what the loop condition is and to write the loop body. And if you look at the kind of code we've ended up here with, there's some conspicuous things. In this particular solution one, we've got a number of special cases going on. In the second part, we've got this one where we have to cut an L that way. We have this one where we have to calculate L that way, and we have this one where we have to calculate L that way. So we've got three special cases sitting there, and we have an auxiliary, an auxiliary array. In this second one, we've managed to get away without the, the auxiliary array, but we still have two different ways of calculating the length, those two. So still two separate cases. In this last one, we have no auxiliary array, and we have only one case, which is there. So in terms of length of code, in terms of special cases, in terms of difficulty of checking, there's two ways of looking at it. This is longer, but it's very easy to see what's going on. We need an auxiliary array B, but unless the problem is very huge, that's not gonna matter anyway. So there's quite a lot to be said for this first solution. This second one is maybe the weirdest one. It gets rid of the auxiliary array B, but it still has these special cases. So it's a little bit, and it's a little bit difficult to see what's going on here. And this third one, if you just saw this, just what's inside that circle I've just drawn, it's quite likely you wouldn't be able to figure out what's going on at all. What on earth is this in for? And what's it doing? What's its meaning? So this third one you could argue is the most obscure of the three, although it's the neatest and the shortest and probably the fastest too. They're all linear time, but this one, because it does less, is going to go a constant time, a constant factor faster than the other two. But just as it is, it looks a little bit obscure. So there is something when you do this that you must always remember, and that is you must bring the invariant along as part of the program's documentation. Just as you would, of course, bring the comment here along as part of that program's documentation, and you'll probably hear talk about the caterpillar's head and tail. So the program doesn't stand on its own. It must have its documentation if it's to be maintained and understood. And the thing that's changed here is that this documentation is what explains that program. And if you understand this invariant, then you will understand it program is doing and it's much shorter than the other ones and much neater as well. So if you're prepared to write comments in that style and if you're prepared to use loop variants to design your program then you have available the ability to write programs like this instead of those ones. Although in fact any one of these provided they're correct 
would have probably got you full marks if this was a one five or one assignment. But you don't learn everything in one hit. You learn things gradually, and this is where we're headed. This is where you would be going in 6721. So I'm going to finish off now with two conclusions. The first one is just to make sure that we understand the role of testing in this whole process. Those two programs on the previous slide, those three programs, rather, all three of them, I typed them in and I tested them. And I found three errors. In other words, there were three instances, in fact, four, if you look, if you look there, one, two, three, four, of where those programs were wrong. The first two were transcription errors. In other words, from my handwritten program, I typed in the wrong thing. Here, for example, I, I saw a T and for some reason I typed in a one. Here I saw an H and I typed in an L. I didn't notice, but when I ran it, I got the wrong answer. Here, I forgot to put the loop, the, the increment loop counter. And that, that happens to the best of us at unexpected times. In my case, it happened because I was using a for loop on a piece of paper and I translated it into a while loop when I wrote it down. And of course, on the for loop, there is no increment and I forgot to write one. So what happened when I ran it there was that it went into an infinite loop and it just sat there. And finally, this initialization here of K in the um, first one, it's actually quite tricky and I got it wrong. And I didn't check with a what's true here comment and I paid the price. So there were these four errors in those three programs. Luckily, the third really short program didn't have any errors. So the answer is, even if you do things this way, you still must test. Now, you know that already, of course, and in that respect, I don't have to tell you this, but you will encounter when you talk to people like this, especially people who are skeptical, they will try to say sometimes that people who believe in designing programs carefully in this style have the opinion that if they do it this way, they don't have to test their programs and they will be right first time. That is completely false. It's just not true. You have to test because there are all sorts of places that errors can creep in. But you still get all the benefits of writing shorter and sometimes faster and much more easily maintained programs. The other thing is that when you do have problems with your programs and they are not running properly, even though you did develop them carefully, if you've got what's true here comments in the program, it tells you what kind of print statements to put in. Typically, what people do when they're trying to debug a program that they cannot see immediately the problem with is they print out values and variables and then they try to figure out whether they have the values they're expecting. How much easier it would be if you had written a what's true here comment or what's supposed to be true here comment involving the variables and instead of printing those variables values, you printed the Boolean that was the thing, the property they were supposed to have. If L is supposed to be less than H, you don't print L and then print H and then look in your output to see whether L is less than H. You actually print L less than H as a Boolean value. If you do that with all of these what's true here comments that you have used to write your program anyway, so they're already there, you don't have to make them up now, you just print them out and you look for the one that's false. It's so simple. And that tells you where the error is. Then of course you have to figure out why it's false, but at least you know immediately where the error is. It's an astonishingly efficient way of debugging programs. The second conclusion, and there's only two, is to discuss whether programs coded this way go faster. And people often ask this, and the answer is sometimes they do. The reason they ask the question is that the programs that are used to illustrate this technique are usually ones for which the uh, what's true here comment style gives you a faster program. Why do we do that? Because it's impressive. But there is a link. <clears throat> usually, programs that are easy to write are also the slowest because you're not using any algorithmic tricks to get extra speed. A really extreme example of that is Fibonacci, which is here. I've got two examples. Fibonacci numbers, as you know, are the ones where the next number of the sequence is equal to the sum of the two before. So if it starts at one, 
Um, we started it, well, actually, yes, it started with one now. One is the first one. One is the second one that's given. And the third one is the sum of those. The fourth one is the sum of those. The fifth one is the sum of those, and so on. These things turn up all over the place. And if you like this kind of thing, you will have heard about all of the uh, natural phenomena that have Fibonacci numbers, so to speak, built in and the golden ratio and all that kind of thing. They have this very, very simple recursive recurrence relation. And from that, you can immediately write a recursive program to calculate it. You just basically write down what's there above. So this is a really, really easy to program, easy to write program. It's easy because it is tied immediately to the definition. The trouble is that this really easy program to write takes exponential time because every call of fib, I'll just expand this again, calls fib again, except for, for the last ones, twice more. So it doubles every time, more or less. So it takes forever for a big one. Now, of course, <clears throat> of course, we all know, if you've ever done this, that there's a very easy linear way to do this just by keeping two of them at the same time. And each time you use the previous one and the current one to get the next one, I'd say you only ever have two. This is a bit like the caterpillar. You just keep the two and you keep moving along and this takes linear time. This is also easy to understand because what I did up here by adding each one to the one before was actually what this program does, not what that does. I didn't say, hmm, what's Fibonacci 13? Well, I better go off and work out what Fibonacci 8 and Fibonacci 5 is. And then, oh, for Fibonacci 5, I need to work out what Fibonacci 2, Fibonacci 3 is, and so on. I didn't actually do this. This one is attractive because it's equal to the definition. This one is attractive because it describes this actual process. But this one is astonishing. That takes logarithmic time. That is to say, if you want to calculate Fibonacci um, 10,000, it only takes twice as long, um, 10, 000, um, three times as long as calculating Fibonacci 1000. Whereas if we were using the linear one, it would take 10 times as long. And if we we're using the exponential, it would take two to the 10th. The difference between the exponential and the logarithmic, logarithmic is extreme, even between the linear, the linear and the logarithmic, logarithmic is extreme. But this program is bizarre. It's the only way you could describe it. What on earth are all those variables doing? You would have no hope in writing this straight down unless you had some kind of method for finding these things and some kind of way of understanding that it was right. So here's the link between speed and what's true here comments. With the what's true here comments, you can actually develop this program and be sure it's right. If you were doing it just by the seat of your pants, I think you would have very little chance of doing that. So sometimes they do go faster. So the answer is not necessarily in general, but in general also, the faster programs tend to be more complicated. And so having reliable reasoning methods increases your reach. You can write faster programs because you can understand more programs than you could understand before. So, we are nearly done now, but there's one last thing I want to show you as a nice example. If you feel like studying this further, you can look it up in that chapter of the textbook that's associated with 6721. It's a slightly different program. Instead of this long repeating thing, you still have this array A, but you're trying to find the length of the longest, the, the largest sum of any subsegment in it. Now, if they're all non negative numbers, of course, you take all of A. That's got to be the biggest. But if there's negative ones in there, you'll always be faced with the problem of, do I take the very next number that happens to be minus 100 in order to get the three after that, which add up to 99? And the answer would be no, because the overall increase in the sum would be minus one. And so it's quite a tricky thing. In spite of that, there's a very easy program for it. And here it is. All you do is have L and H which are the beginning and the end of every subsegment, And you go through all of those with these double while loops. And then for each L and H inside here, you take the sum of that segment, and then you just do the max here. So it's three nested whiles, and it takes n cubed time. 
and that's easy to see and it's easy to write and it's easy to get correct. The only little tiny, tiny tricky bit here is making sure that you don't write less than or equal to there. However, using exactly the same technique that we used on the third solution of the earlier problem, you get this algorithm, which does it in linear time. And you do that by having invariance beforehand. So you go from cubic to linear, and with an invariant, we can understand this program. And without an invariant, we probably could not. So that's the end of this talk. Um, where this stuff is described in more detail is in this course, which is usually runs in T2 and it will next year. And I thank you guys for coming along in uh, Flexibility Week. So there we are. Thank you. Thank you very much for um, coming, Carol. And uh, I know this, this will, will have been very helpful to some people and hopefully we'll post it up on the YouTube as well afterwards. So it's um, accessible there too. Um, probably check if there are any questions as well. Yeah. I can hear somebody speaking, but they quite think oh, that's so uh, Yeah, uh, I had a question, which was, um, can this technique of finding the invariant and documenting it be used or be applied to pre-existing programs as part of a sort of a, a formal verification method? Yes, you can. Um, if the previous program has been written by an expert programmer, as all of you will eventually become, it's quite likely that he or she will have had an invariant in mind without actually realizing. But usually what happens when you do that is you find that you try to develop an invariant to the program and they're a little bit good, but they're quite quick until you adjust the program so that they do cool. So it's kind of qualified, um, yes. Very often you can find an invariant, uh, but sometimes you have to change the program a little bit. Um, so if you're asking, is it worth looking for invariants? The answer is definitely yes. The other thing is that it's, um, it's very nice from now on, now that you've seen this stuff, to ask yourself as you're writing a program, even if you're not doing this way, could I think of an invariant? Could, could I use an invariant? And that's the way you get a little bit better. Okay? Excellent, thanks. Doesn't look like there's any more questions. I don't think so. But David says that he wouldn't mind sharing the YouTube link with a couple of people he works with. Um, it'll get posted to the Comp 1511 YouTube channel. So you can just have a look on there in the next few days. Okay, great. Cool. Right, Thank you I'll very much. Stop recording and hope that it actually did record. <laughs> Okay, bye bye then. David, yeah, it, it's still going to be the the YouTube channel is public. So if you just look Google Google for UNSW Comp One Five One One, if you have a look on say Sunday, um, it'll be visible there. Okay, cool. So stop recording. Yes.